This program is made possible by grants from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the City's Service Company. I'm Pat Tyler, and you're getting ready to board the USS Eisenhower, the newest nuclear-powered supercarrier in America's multi-billion dollar fleet. Congressional Outlook is on location near Newport News, Virginia, and we'll be talking to some admirals and to some other military strategists about the future of the Navy. She squats on the water for a distance of about 1,100 feet. Her flight deck covers about four and a half acres. She carries about a hundred of the most sophisticated attack airplanes and bombers in the world. And she is home for more than 5,000 men at a time. And she, in this case, is named after a he, President Dwight D. Eisenhower. The Eisenhower cost about a billion dollars to build, and it'll cost ten times that much to operate before she is mothballed in the 21st century. But more importantly, they are those who say that big deck carriers like this one would hit the bottom like 95,000 tons of bricks in the first 30 minutes of a war with the Soviet Union. Even the Navy won't challenge that analysis entirely. Meet Admiral Isaac Kidd, Jr., the outgoing Supreme Commander for Allied Naval Forces in the Atlantic. Kidd's father was lost on the battleship Arizona at Pearl Harbor, and much as the Japanese dive bombers penetrated the battleship's defenses, Kidd sees the Russian missile as a similar threat to the carrier. Now, I'd be a damn fool if I sat here and uh, told you that we're capable of denying any from getting through. Some are going to get through, and we're going to get a humdinger of a bloody nose. Are we going to lose a billion-dollar carrier? Oh, probably several. Folks seem to forget the fact that this is a risky business, going to war. Like the battleship before it, the supercarrier has become the nucleus of the fleet since it proved itself during World War II. It earned its reputation with the blood of stubborn pilots in the battles of Midway and on the Coral Sea. But also, as in the case of the battleship, the big deck carrier has attracted its share of torpedoes from critics who think it has become too easy a target for the Russian missiles. Because it is so big, so conspicuous, and so expensive, the supercarrier finds itself the object of an almost perennial budget fight in the Pentagon and in the Congress. Now listen to two of the congressional warriors who have taken opposite sides in the carrier debate. First, listen to Senator Gary Hart of Colorado, and then you'll hear from Representative Charles E. Bennett of Florida, who talked with Don Smith of Congressional Quarterly. Well, if someone once said, if, if, if you were an admiral, you'd like to be on a bigger ship than on a smaller one. And, um, I, I think that may be a little harsh, but on the other hand, there is something to commanding a 95,000-ton ship as opposed to a 20,000-ton ship. It's a, it, it has 5,500 or 6,000 men on it and 100 of the most high-performance aircraft in the world. And it costs uh, two or two and a half billion dollars to build and another billion for the aircraft and all the equipment. And, and that's quite a nice thing to command. A senator has a lot more glory than an admiral has. To say that an admiral would want to have glory by having, by having big ships, uh, to me, is a very terrible derogation of people who are very dedicated to our national defense. So if Senator Hart said that, he must uh, rethink it, because it's just not so. 1978 was no different than previous budget years, as committees in both the House of Representatives and the Senate grappled with the fate of one final supercarrier on the drawing boards. But after the dust settled, one thing was clear. In the words of a Brookings Institution report, the place of these costly and notably vulnerable ships in the American defense structure of the future is open to serious question. Nevertheless, the Brookings report concluded, the commitment to the aircraft carrier for the next decade appears to be firm. Misgivings about the vulnerability of these ships either have been set aside or have been reduced in light of protective systems under development. If that sounds to you like a national policy of we've got to go with what we've got, it is. As long as you tell me that I've got to ensure the reinforcement of the alliance and the resupply, and that means the resupply of our youngsters that are now in place in Europe, we're not going to let them die in the vine. That's not the American way. Never has been. We've got to resupply the youngsters that go over 
by way of reinforcement, and we've got to resupply the folks that live there, the likes of you and me and our families, the women and children, the civilians. That's the number that's the mind-boggling one that comes down to some 6,000 round trips per month by 6,000 ships. Now, to do that, we've got to control the airspace over those dispositions of ships as they move. To control the airspace, you need airplanes. And to operate the airplanes with the requisite capability to control that airspace, you end up with something the size of the platforms we've got. But what was even more clear after the budget battle of 1978 was that the debate that will absorb Congress in the coming months and years will focus on what sort of general navy we will need in the 21st century. Since shipbuilding decisions made today will shape the navy of the future, we asked some of the experts to first define the role of the navy 20 years hence. Listen to retired Admiral Thomas Moore, who served as chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff from 1970 to 1974. Well, in my opinion, uh, the Navy in the future has a really a greater role than it's ever had before uh, for the following reasons. In the first place, the world is shifting from a world of surplus to a world of shortage. The first the manifestation of that is, of course, in a uh, case of oil. But nevertheless, uh, the populations are increasing, the demands are going up, and the natural resources available to people at large is... Uh, diminishing and consequently uh, I feel that the transport of these natural resources to the industrialized nations and subsequently the distribution of the finished products and this includes food of course which is going to be impacted heavily by the increase in population uh, I believe this uh, import and export can only be done by by the sea uh, because uh, we're talking about tremendous quantities and consequently, I think that, in my view, uh, confrontations uh, will be regional in nature, and they will, in fact, be over the availability of resources. And the Navy uh, is uh, uh, certainly uh, in demand in that case. Now, secondly, uh, there has been a very significant decrease in the number of bases available to the United States worldwide. I mean, there's been a radical decrease, and unfortunately, the communists are in most of the bases that we had 10 years ago. This is true in Africa, in Angola, Mozambique. It's true in Wheelis Air Force Base in Libya. It's true in uh, South Vietnam. Uh, we have moved out of uh, many bases in Thailand, and consequently, uh, only the Navy can move around the globe in protection of the U.S. interest uh, without gaining... Uh, uh, permission from some other sovereign nation in advance. So I'm uh, very optimistic about the role of the Navy in the future. How prepared, then, is the United States to assume that role? Not very, according to retired Admiral Elmo Zumwalt, who was Chief of Naval Operations during the Nixon administration. The result of the Soviet having been permitted to outspend us by 50% for over a decade is that the odds are high that the Soviet Union would defeat the United States in a naval war at sea for the reasonable assumptions. Uh, that began to be the case as early as 1971, and the odds have gone steadily downward as we have underfunded our requirements and the Soviets have uh, outbuilt us. That includes, of course, long-range Soviet naval air flying out of their land bases and their submarine force two and a half to three times the size of ours and their cruise missiles they've got their cruise missiles at sea and deployed while we're still talking about building ours I don't know uh, whether he's right or not the short answer to your question from my point of view as the temporary custodian of responsibility to you the taxpayer for the defense of these United States uh, is, is very fundamental. If I thought I was going to lose, I wouldn't have taken the doggone job in the first place. I would say that there is a time, perhaps a decade or two down the road, when if we do get into a crisis situation with the Soviet Union or perhaps one or two other powers where we'll have built the wrong Navy, and that's what worries me, 
uh, we can take some steps now, and with the long lead time involved in building these ships, you have to make decisions now which will only begin to be felt, uh, in this case, in the late 1980s, early 1990s. On the other hand, if we put those decisions off, it'll be early into the 21st century, and it may be too late. That's what worries me, is you cannot turn something like the Navy around on a dime or overnight. These ships last for 20 or 30 years. Uh, they, they can't be replaced because of their high cost of, of, um, of construction and all the rest of it. So we're locked in for a decade or decade and a half to the kind of Navy that we're building right now, and, and that's what concerns me. Well, I think that uh, heretofore we thought of the Navy in terms of having uh, uh, more or less worldwide control. Uh, and it is true that the Soviet Navy has uh, expanded rapidly, and they have, in effect, uh, converted from being a, a more or less a uh, coastline defense force to a, a, a worldwide uh, uh, maritime power. However, in uh, those areas where the United States has a national interest, uh, I believe the uh, Navy uh, would, uh, U.S. Navy would be uh, uh, significantly superior. At the same time, I would go on to say that unless uh, significant and timely efforts are made to increase the size of the Navy and replace old ships uh, and uh, expand the shipbuilding program, I doubt this situation will uh, exist into the 80s. Let's leave this floating city now and take a look at our own spot check of public opinion. In many ways, I feel the aircraft carriers are obsolete. They're large, not particularly fast, and very vulnerable to attack. I'd rather see us invest our very limited defense dollar in something such as the cruise missile, which seems to be working out very well. I feel that we ought to uh, maintain the status quo as far as our aircraft carriers are concerned. I think they've been such an integral part of the Navy in the past, and unfortunately our next involvement militarily, I'm afraid, is going to be a, in a more conventional mode, and our aircraft carriers will be an integral part of that. Well, I think we do need to modernize the Navy by investing in newer, smaller, faster ships. The, we have a large number of aircraft carriers, but they really fit fighting the last war, not any future conflict we might have to engage in. So I think our Navy should remain comparable to that of the Soviets. After all, that's where the, the primary force lies in the world right now. They seem to have surpassed our Navy by leaps and bounds. To better understand those who think the Navy is obsessed with the power and the might of the big deck carrier, let's go back more than 50 years when, not too far from here on the Chesapeake Bay, a young general named Billy Mitchell was trying to drive home a similar point about an earlier super ship. Since the day England sank the Spanish Armada in 1588, the battleship had been the toughest naval bulldog afloat. But on July 21st, 1921, Young Mitchell and his six flying crates eased out over the Chesapeake Bay, where far below them stood the hulk of a German battle wagon, ready to test the metal of Mitchell's bombs. Navy brass feared the airplane that Mitchell was trying to sell to the War Department, and Mitchell ignored the Navy's condition that only small bombs be used. But the thunder of his direct hits won the day for him. The unsinkable Leviathan rolled over and foundered in 20 minutes. So goes a similar argument today. The threat of Mitchell's bombs have been replaced by Russian missiles, faster and more dangerous, more accurate and more menacing than ever. Therefore, critics say, the big nuclear carriers of today are sitting ducks and are better left to slip quietly into extinction early in the next century. The 90,000 ton carrier is not a beast of the past. The country would be better off and we would have a higher probability of victory if instead of building the 90,000 nuclear-propelled beast uh, and another like it, we were building three fossil fuel aircraft carriers of smaller size, lesser cost, and for the same amount of money having uh, a larger number of platforms. They can be knocked out or disabled by the, the highly precise new uh, uh, missiles that can be aimed at ships at sea, either surface to surface or air to surface. And these missiles, as, as you know, have gotten very accurate. They're relatively inexpensive, so a lot of them can be fired. And, and one or, or two or three of those can, can do great damage to a carrier at sea. So you're, so you're putting so much of your assets in the one package that can be disabled or, or sunk even. At the Brookings Institution, Robert Berman is a resident expert on Soviet naval strength. 
no doubt that uh, aircraft carriers, uh, service ships in particular, all service ships in particular, uh, would have to fight for their lives in an area as intense as the Norwegian Sea or Eastern Mediterranean or some parts of the Sea of Japan. We've never built a ship yet you can't sink. And as four years as chief of naval material and production responsible for building them, and having served in several wars and watched some of them go down, let me tell you, if you hit anything that floats often enough, it'll go down. Why should the Navy be building smaller targets? Critics of the Super Navy put it this way. For the first time, the Soviets have ventured forth onto the world's oceans with an array of anti-ship weaponry capable of hurling as many as 1,400 high-explosive warheads against a variety of targets in a single instant. To an American Navy built around a dozen large aircraft carriers, that could mean more than 100 incoming missiles per carrier. Can anything defend against that? Anything? Yes, and we practice at that seven days a week in the matter of layered defense. That's the reason you and I are buying long-range missiles, very long-range missiles, fighters still farther out, the F-14 and the Phoenix, for example, to shoot down missiles in flight, then the closer-in fighters, then the long-range missiles from the ships themselves, the medium-range missiles from the ships themselves, and finally back here, the point defense for those that get through. And the Soviets have always considered the nuclear, the aircraft carrier, a nuclear threat, uh, particularly since the late 50s, uh, and they built forces to sink those carriers. We've passed the point where we can, with any degree of certainty, guarantee they're not going to be sunk. Whether the American Navy could prevail in the first 30 minutes of a conventional war might depend on how well those 12 giant carriers could absorb perhaps dozens of direct and simultaneous hits. The losses are going to be staggering. Just staggering. Nevertheless, a 1978 Georgetown University study concluded that, short of a direct nuclear hit, the carrier is the least sinkable ship ever built, and the larger the carrier, the less vulnerable it is to sinking. Supporters of the big carrier hasten to point out that in 1969, nine large bombs exploded on the deck of the USS Enterprise, the first nuclear supercarrier. That was the equivalent of being hit by six Soviet cruise missiles. Yet Navy officials say that had it been necessary, the Enterprise could have resumed flight operations within several hours of the explosions. The aircraft carrier as the centerpiece of the Navy and of the task force, the strike force, is, makes a great deal of sense in modern warfare. The problem is we're building too few of them. The reason we're building too few is that they've gotten so expensive. The reason they've gotten so expensive is that we're building them too large. So what I'd like to have is more aircraft carriers, not fewer that consequently to afford more, we'll have to build smaller ones. We can do that because of new technology aircraft. We can put on those, the so-called V-stall, vertical or short takeoff uh, and landing aircraft. Given that breakthrough technology with that kind of aircraft, we can then put air assets at sea on smaller decks, and that's what we ought to do. That, if we've made any mistake in national defense, and we've made several, uh, I think the worst one is to, to spend lots of money on a program which is not yet proven and the V-Star program is not yet proven. So far as the cost of aircraft carrier is concerned, I'd point out to you that the, uh, this always appears as a single line item. If one looks at the cost of a land base, you see the hospital in one line item, the, F, the runway in another, or the hangar in another, and you can uh, thumb through the budget till you're blue in the face and you'll never find out exactly how much it costs. But I would hasten to point out that whereas hundreds of millions of dollars worth of aircraft were destroyed by mortar fire in Vietnam, not one Navy aircraft was lost by mortar fire. In addition, we spent billions of dollars for airfields, which are now occupied by the communists, and the communists don't occupy one single aircraft carrier. So when you look at the cost, you have to look at the utility. And furthermore, you look at the uh, longevity, because uh, when you buy an aircraft carrier, you're buying a military uh, system that... Uh, can be used 30 or 40 years. When you talk about big carriers versus little carriers, sir, I'd respectfully remind you that it's not 
uh, just a compulsion on the part of people in naval uniform to build a bigger ship. That's the farthest from the truth. Because the minute we got to a carrier size that couldn't go through the Panama Canal, it's just like shooting yourself in the foot. Because the, the potential for the swing concept, the concentration of force, east to west, west to east, using the canal was eliminated. So we have been trying, obviously not with any spectacular degree of success, to find a capability to operate from a smaller ship. It's the size of the doggone airplane that sizes the carrier, whether we like it or not. Though his views often clash with those of his colleagues, Senator Hart is the sea power enthusiast of the Senate. In the House of Representatives, Charles E. Bennett of Florida heads up the naval wing of the Armed Services Committee. Bennett has a reputation of speaking up for the admirals and for taking an occasional broadside at presidents who cut back on shipbuilding budgets. Uh, I don't myself know of any reluctance on the part of the Navy to uh, achieve new equipment. In fact, the Navy has requested new equipment which uh, the president's budget does not allow. Uh, so there, there is no uh, reluctance on the part of the Navy to go to new inventions. Now, the inventions are not always things that do everything everybody thinks they do. For instance, we've got some real fast ships now that can, that can move uh, at a tremendous speed, and there's a reluctance to build them, but, but the reluctance is based on the fact that they, they're not going to carry large numbers of people, and they're not going to carry a lot of material. They're going to go into a place real quick on the surface of the sea and destroy other ships and then get back out. And of course that's a function of the Navy, but it's not the sole function of the Navy. You still have to have large uh, carriers to, to, have, to have moving airports, if you want to call it that. You still have to have um, uh, submarines to strike other submarines and anti-submarine warfare. The, the functions are, are of the Navy are still pretty much like they always have been. There hasn't been any great change in that except the adding the air. Uh, the argument that, that air power at sea is something that's required, uh, I believe that it is, uh, is uh, too difficult to overcome uh, by, by just saying we don't need carriers. I mean, you need the alternative, and the alternative would be Vestal, uh, where you can sort of take all your eggs out of uh, that one basket and sort of spread them around a little bit. And I think that has an awful lot uh, to offer uh, for you know, the future Navy. The importance of a navy was a lesson well learned by the founding fathers after their struggle to assemble a fleet of privateers to hurl before the British men of war during the revolution. The Constitution stated clearly that Congress would provide and maintain a navy, but early on presidents like Thomas Jefferson showed a willingness to engage the navy in the battle of the budget. Jefferson regarded the infant service as costly and imperialistic. Once in office he slashed the shipbuilding budget and sold off nearly all of the navy's warships. But the War of 1812 refreshed the nation's memory about the value of a strong navy. Virtually unchallenged by American coastal patrols, the British marched their marines ashore and sacked the city of Washington, D.C. with impunity. Ever since, America has been a determined naval power, ready to sail in harm's way on any ocean. In this century, the battle over the shipbuilding budget has sparked an occasional revolt among the admirals, but naval power has learned to live alongside of air power. In 1979, the Navy will soak up more than $40 billion, almost one-third of the entire defense budget. But the crucial question for taxpayers and their congressmen is this. How should America spend those countless billions that the Navy of the future will cost? We put that question to 37-year-old James Woolsey, who was President Carter's undersecretary of the Navy. So I would anticipate that out by the turn of the 21st century, if the developments in uh, vertical and short-range takeoff uh, landing aircraft, so-called V-stall aircraft, uh, continue to be promising, that uh, by the year 2000, we would be able to be moving toward uh, considerably smaller carrier carriers with uh, high performance, that is to say, supersonic uh, V-stall fighter attack aircraft on them. But that's not a decision, and this is, I think, the key point. That is not a decision that one really needs to make today. We have uh, some time, uh, assuming we go ahead and build one more carrier, to uh, uh, wait until uh, late in the 1980s before we make a decision as to whether or not the carriers that we'll be building during the 1990s uh, to replace the current carriers are to be, uh, uh, say, 60,000 tons or larger, uh, the range we're talking about now, 
uh, whether conventional or nuclear, or whether they're to be, uh, uh, say, half that size or smaller and be able to take only vertical and short-range takeoff and landing aircraft. Whither goes the Navy? According to Mr. Woolsey, that's the question that everybody likes to ask around budget time. And when congressmen and defense planners climb onto the annual maritime merry-go-round, the discussion returns inevitably to the usefulness of the supercarrier. You heard Senator Hart say that the aircraft carrier has to play an important role in the Navy of the future, but Senator Hart's carrier would be smaller and loaded with space-age fighters able to fly straight up in a single bound. Congressman Bennett of Florida argues that Americans shouldn't throw good money after an unperfected technology. The debate over the aircraft carrier is sure to be with us for the next couple of decades, but the shape of the rest of the fleet will just as surely spark continuous debate. James L. Holloway, the just retired chief of naval operations, summed things up like this. The American people must decide, he said, what kind of navy will sail into the 21st century. If you have something to say about the future of the navy, there are three people in your life who can speak best for you on this issue, and they are the two United States senators from your state and the congressman who represents the district you live in. In our system of government, they may not always vote the way you tell them, but it is a political fact of life that they must listen to what you say. So why not get a pencil and find a stamp and sit down today to write your own congressional outlook? I'm Pat Tyler. For a transcript of this program, send $1 to Congressional Quarterly, 1414 22nd Street, Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20037. solely responsible for its content and was made possible by grants from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the city's service company.